I think let's just get started with what is protein? Why do we need it? And also I hear people say only bodybuilders need a lot of protein. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, so protein. Well, first of all, it's definitely without question the most important single macronutrient. And everybody has a huge absolute requirement for protein on a daily basis. You know, you don't have to eat any carbohydrate at all, as I'm sure a lot of your viewership knows. And actually, the amount of essential fatty acids people need every day is microscopically small. You really only need a few grams of essential fatty acids a day. And you only you honestly can get by with like maybe 10 grams of fat without totally imploding your gallbladder. But uh, the, the amount of fat you need, pretty low. The amount of carbs you need, technically zero. Uh, protein. Everybody has a huge, absolute requirement for protein. You're uh, accepting water, um, we, you know, you're 60% water or more than that. But uh, outside of water, in terms of human dry weight, you're mostly protein, or you should be more mostly protein, unless you're just hugely obese. So Protein is by far and away the most important component in your body. It's the most important macronutrient. Everyone's losing protein all day, every day from shedding skin cells and shedding the lining of your GI tract and making all your hormones and turnover of all your structures. And so you just have to eat protein, 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 protein. Protein should be primary. Protein is the most important macronutrient. And if you look at any study in the history of medical literature throughout the world for anything, anytime, for any reason, protein always beats other macronutrients when you uh, substitute them out isocalorically. So protein is basically where it's at. And that's, that's kind of my message. <laughs> awesome. I actually eat my body weight in protein. And I had someone comment on one of my videos saying, you eat 115 grams of protein a day. That's absolutely way too much protein. You're eating as much protein as a male bodybuilder. And now I'm sure the person who commented that was, was probably a doctor, of course, but um, what would you say is a good amount of protein for someone to eat? And does it depend on who you are, male or female, or someone's age, or whether someone's active or not? Or is there kind of just a good rule of thumb of how much protein in grams someone should eat? Right. Well, there's, there's a really great rule of thumb that I love, and it's pretty much a gram per pound of your ideal body weight or your reference body weight or what you're supposed to weigh for your height and gender. So <clears throat> in other words, you can look up your gender and your height and see you know, what you're supposed to weigh, just like an ideal average reference human. Uh, for women, it's 100 pounds for the first five feet and then five pounds for each inch over five feet. So, you know, if you're 110 pounds, you're supposed to weigh, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, if you're five foot two, that would be 100, 100 pounds for the first five feet, and then 10 pounds for the additional two inches, and you should weigh 110, and you should probably target 110 grams of protein every day. And for men, it's the same thing, except men get 110 pounds for the first five feet, and then the same as women, five pounds for each additional inch. So, um, you know, for example, I'm 5'10", so I get 110 pounds for the five foot part, and then I get another 50 pounds for the 10 inches times five pounds per inch, and that brings you to 160 pounds, which would be like an ideal reference target weight for a five foot 10 inch male. And so my recommendation to pretty much everyone just out of the box is to target a gram per pound of ideal or reference body weight. That's not what you actually weigh because you can be a thousand pounds and you can't eat that much protein. It's not what um, you want to weigh because maybe you want to be a 300 pound power lifter. It's basically what you're supposed to weigh or your ideal weight for your height. That's what I was going to ask next was what about if someone's trying to maintain weight versus someone who's trying to lose weight, does the amount of protein someone should eat change? Well, technically, you know, if you're trying to add on a lot more muscle, it might be beneficial to eat more calories and more protein, but it's probably not going to be that effective. So you, you can actually start out with a gram per pound of ideal body weight. For pretty much anyone for any goal, this works for men and women. This actually uh, even applies to younger persons, adolescents, and you can kind of use a gram per pound of ideal body weight. Technically, this works all the way down to infants. You can almost use um, this for any human at any stage in the life cycle, at any age and gender, um, and it kind of works. So it's a, in terms of a rule of thumb, it's just a really good starting point. 
Um, I, I would also push back big time against the argument that that's just for bodybuilders and not for some sedentary, overweight, out of shape, middle-aged person, because that person is actually probably having a slightly higher protein requirement. They might be turning over more uh, skeletal muscle for gluconeogenesis because they have some insulin resistance going on. This person, their protein requirements is going to be just as high or maybe even a little bit higher based on their metabolic status. So type 2 diabetics, for example, actually have slightly higher protein requirements than um, lean, healthy persons. Older people have higher protein requirements than younger people because they have anabolic resistance. And so the argument that, well, I'm a postmenopausal woman who just sits around and I'm overweight and diabetic, so that's way too much protein, uh, that's exactly 180 degrees wrong. You actually have a higher protein requirement. And it's your lean, young, super healthy, ripped bodybuilder type who could actually get by with a little bit less protein. You know what I mean? You'll find some vegan bodybuilders who are just barely hitting a gram per pound of ideal body weight, and they're just completely ripped and jacked. So they they're actually have a slightly lower uh, protein requirement than someone who's older and sedentary and not active and in metabolically poor health. So if you look at, you know, um, uh, uh, American adults age 70 to 79, they're eating about 66 grams of protein a day and only maybe 38 grams of high quality animal protein a day. And they're instead they're eating, you know, 270 grams of carbohydrate and their health is a disaster. And they have, you know, we have this epidemic of sarcopenia and osteopenia and frailty and all these problems. And so what happens is that, yeah, old people, their protein intake does go down and their health sucks. And so there's probably uh, association there. So uh, what, what people are actually doing is not what they actually should be doing, basically. Yeah. And I guess that makes me think of the question I hear a lot too is, isn't too much protein bad for your kidneys though? Right, right. So this is pretty much fraudulently wrong. So now if you, when you have kidney damage, uh, you have more protein showing up in your urine. And the worse that gets, the worse your kidney problems are. And so because of this, a lot of doctors are like, ooh, the more protein is in your urine, uh, the worse your kidney function is. And the more protein you eat, the more it just naturally ends up in your urine anyway. So we started coming up with this concept that you should probably restrict protein if you have a kidney issue. The problem with that is that uh, we've never really proven that that's effective. And in fact, for the vast majority of people with chronic kidney disease, protein restriction has not been shown to be of any benefit at all in uh, reversing it, preventing it, slowing it down or anything else. So uh, almost all of the chronic kidney disease I see in medical practice due to diabetes and hypertension and things like that uh, don't benefit from protein restriction. And so it's pretty much not evidence-based to even try to restrict most of these people's protein intake. Uh, the other concept that protein damages your kidneys, we've literally disproven this. And we have very high protein feeding studies that prove that kidney function is not negatively affected. Now, your kidneys do have to work hard to um, get rid of huge amounts of protein. And you will actually see glomerular filtration rate go up, kidney size goes up. Basically, your kidney gets bigger and stronger because you're demanding more out of it, just the way you know your legs would get bigger and stronger if you're doing heavy leg presses all day long or something like that. So this does represent something the kidney is doing, but it's actually good for you and not bad. In fact, uh, more recently, we have some meta-analyses that suggest that higher protein diets are more protective against kidney problems to begin with. So yeah, like the whole proteins bad for your kidneys needs to just die in a fire. That's just basically garbage. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> and I've also heard people say you should restrict protein for longevity. And my channel is about people living their longest, healthiest, best quality lives. So I'm sure um, 
maybe eating lots of protein is not bad for my kidneys, but surely I'm decreasing my lifespan, right? Yeah, uh, there, the problem with that is there's no actual studies in, in higher order organisms, like uh, especially humans, that would demonstrate that protein restriction increases lifespan. Uh, there are some theories, you know, you'll see uh, Dr. Walter Longo talk about some mouse driven data that suggests that lower protein diets might extend lifespan. And there's some associational stuff that says when you're in your early middle age, protein restriction is good. But once you hit like 60 years old, then you actually need more protein. And so uh, pretty much the data is all over the place. It's all very low quality evidence. It's contradictory. And nobody's really demonstrated that protein restriction extends lifespan in humans at all. Awesome. And there's so many myths out there on so much, not just protein, but other things in, in the, the medical field that are kind of kind of like turning into myths. Um, but right. I kind of leads me into my next question on let's hypothetically assume everyone agrees we need protein. We, we need a certain amount of protein to thrive. Is there any difference in the quality of protein? So maybe animal protein versus plant protein? Is that the same? Well, <clears throat> On one hand, every food that you eat, you know, the proteins just get broken down into individual amino acids. And so those amino acids are kind of the same, whether you got it from animals or plants. But if you look at all the amino acids you got from an animal source versus a plant source, you get a more complete spectrum for building a human when you ingest animal proteins. You basically have uh, all the correct percentages of uh, the amino acids you need to build a mammal when you eat a mammal. You know what I'm saying? It's like a Lego kit, right? You could, you could buy 20 Lego kits to build like a car and then eventually get enough pieces to build a house, but it's not really supposed to build a house. Or you could just get one Lego kit that's a, ha that's a car and build a car out of it. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's like the plant foods, unfortunately, have a slightly skewed amino acid distribution, which is not as good for building animals and maybe not complete. Now you can get by, you can combine proteins, you know, you can get eat your beans and your rice and eventually you'll cobble together enough amino acids to uh, have a complete protein and build muscle, for example. But um, you, then you're wasting some of the aminos, which are skewed in proportion. Uh, there's also digestibility concerns like animal proteins are always considered to be higher quality, like egg and whey is the gold standard for protein because it's nearly 100% digestible, absorbable, and a very perfect essential amino acid spectrum. And then you've got plant foods, you know, like kidney beans are like 60%, whereas egg whites and whey are 100%, for example, on the digestibility and accessibility scores. So plant foods just kind of don't measure up to animal foods. And you can get by, you have to eat more of them, you have to combine them, you have to be worried about it. Um, or you can just eat animal foods and it's an instant win, pretty much. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Um, what are, since you, you did mention whey, but what are your thoughts on then animal protein versus protein bars, protein shakes, protein powder? Is there a difference? I know I used to eat um, protein bars and I thought they were super healthy and not to say that all protein bars are not healthy, but I know the ones I were eating um, in the past were kind of like candy bars, but with more protein. So what are your thoughts on uh, that kind of supplemental protein versus real food animal protein? Got it. Well, you're always better off eating real food. You're going to get a higher satiety per calorie. So the more processed and refined something is, the lower the satiety per calorie and the more likely you are to overeat. And so if you're just getting all your protein from just drinking whey shakes, uh, the satiety is lower than if you eat a steak or eat a chicken breast or something like that. You know, you're going to get um, a lot other, more other things that come along for the ride too. You know, when you eat cellular foods and meat would be a cellular food, you know, made up of cells, you're eating the cell walls and you're getting some essential fats there and you're eating, you're getting a lot of minerals from the cell organelles and you're getting this whole nice little spectrum of cellular components. When you eat a cellular protein, which might just be like egg white or whey, you're not getting some of those trace little things in there and the nutrient density is lower, the satiety is lower. So yeah, getting all your protein from just like soylent or something is not the greatest. You're better off eating real food. I mean, you can obviously get by with, you know, protein bars, but it's not quite as good. What about um, 
the debate between the gr grass-fed and the grain-fed animal products. Obviously, both have are filled with protein, but would you say there's a difference between the grass-fed and the grain-fed? Yeah, I would. I would say in general, uh, grass-fed <clears throat> animals are going to have a slightly better omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. They're also going to be slightly leaner, a slightly higher protein to fat ratio. Um, so if, if you're really trying to be optimal, I do recommend eating animals that they themselves were eating what they're supposed to eat. Uh, that's especially important when it comes to monogastric animals, like wild caught fish is way better than farm fish and uh, pastured organic chicken um, and egg way better than like your factory chickens and eggs. So it's a big deal for monogastrics like chickens, pigs, and fish. A little bit less important for a ruminant like a cow, but still, in my opinion, you want to get the highest quality you can afford. And so I like grass-fed beef. I highly recommend trying to eat animals that were eating what they're supposed to eat. Yeah, and at, at this point, we only buy grass-fed unless, let's say, we're traveling or something and we can't find it. But I always think it's so interesting when people um, try to argue that there's really no difference between grass-fed and grain-fed with the argument that just because um, there's no studies done pro proving otherwise means there's no difference between them. For that, that logic to me is like, well, I'm going to eat grass-fed even if it's a little bit better because a little bit better over time adds up, right. like the compound effect. Um, but other than protein, your work, you talk about energy. So what is this energy and why is that so important? Got it. Okay. All right. So animals have to eat uh, basically plants or animals that have eaten plants. We can't make our own food. So we just walk around ingesting other organisms all day long. Animals are uh, basically just ingesting other li living things 100% of the time. That's what animals do. Plants make their own food, right? They suck minerals up out of the soil, like nitrogen for protein and the other minerals that they need. Um, and then they take sunlight and convert it into chemical energy. That's photosynthesis. So your plant is using carbon dioxide and water just from the air, and they're turning solar energy into chemical energy by chaining together these high energy bonds in carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, and that's carbohydrates and hydrocarbons, which are fats. So all your carbs and fats are just chemical energy from the sun created by plants, and then animals come along and eat all the plants or eat an animal that's eaten plants. And either way, you're getting all your energy from the sun to the plants to you. And so I look at it from a protein to energy ratio because you're getting protein from soil, like nitrogen being sucked up out of the soil, a mineral. And then your energy, carbs or fats, is really just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen chained together in a high energy way. And so in the book, we talk about how carbs versus fats is a little bit interchangeable. Of course, you know, carbs are water soluble, stored in glycogen. Fat is not water soluble, stored in adipocytes. Uh, carbs burn really fast and fat burns kind of slow. And you have these different uh, amounts you can store, you know, 99% is fat and 1% is carbs. So there are big differences between them, but at the end of the day, your mitochondria are just breaking both of these hydrocarbons and carbohydrates into carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that you exhale. And that's how you get all your energy to be alive, all your ATP. So we kind of break down your diet into protein, which is prioritized, and then energy, which can be carbs or fats, a little bit interchangeable. Um, because they're both kind of the same thing. Uh, and, and that's what that's what I mean when I talk about the PE diet and the protein to energy ratio of your diet. It's basically protein versus non-protein energy, which is carbs and fats. As a doctor, what is your favorite way to measure someone's health? Wow. Okay, so my very favorite is just looking in the mirror, right? Like just what do you look like naked? That's that's the best gauge for your average person, right? You're going to know if you're under muscled, if you're over fat. The biggest problem I see in my clinical practice is body composition, where people have too much fat and not enough muscle, Yeah, low lean mass, high fat mass. And what every single person wants is to reverse that. Whether they know it or not, they want the exact opposite. You want higher lean mass and lower fat mass. That's going to improve insulin sensitivity. That's going to reverse a lot of chronic diseases. That's going to so, so whatever makes you look the best is probably going to make you the healthiest. There's really a ton of overlap there. 
Now down from there, you've got uh, measurements like waist circumference. I love waist to height ratio. Uh, you measure your waist right at the belly button, abdomen. You know, first thing in the morning, abdomen fully relaxed. You measure your waist at the belly button. That should be half your height or less. Um, if it's higher than that, that's uh, probably visceral fat. You're probably insulin resistant. Um, the higher that gets, the worse off you are. Um, the thinner that, uh, lower that gets, the better off you are. It's, it scales really nicely. It's almost perfectly linear with uh, fasting insulin and insulin sensitivity. Blood tests are surprisingly less helpful, right? So yeah, I can check someone's fasting glucose, fasting triglycerides, fasting insulin, triglyceride HDL ratio. These things will all sort of mirror, uh, you know, metabolic health, metabolic flexibility, insulin sensitivity. But a good waist to height ratio and how you look is going to get you 90% of the answer for free. And you already know it. You know what I'm saying? So the bottom line is 91% of Americans are overfat and under muscled. And now it's time to try to reverse that with diet and exercise.